It's my pleasure to stand before you and be able to present God's Word. I'm excited that you're here too and that you have uh, set aside this time to come and worship together with us. The question before you is really a simple question. It contains three words. Am I saved? There's hardly a person here who doesn't understand on the most basic level what this question is asking. It's not a difficult question to understand. As well, it shouldn't really be a difficult question to answer. It is a yes or no question. The answer is, yes, I'm saved, or no, I am not saved. But in reality, as we look around the religious landscape, this is one of the most difficult questions. Not because it's a difficult question to comprehend logically or from a language standpoint, but because of the confusion that exists around the topic that this question is seeking to, to discuss, the topic of salvation. That makes this question so very difficult. Not only difficult to understand, but for many difficult to answer. Maybe there is someone here this morning who answers this question honestly, I don't know. I don't know if I'm saved. Maybe there's someone within the sound of my voice who, who maybe answers this question, I, I, I think so. But this shouldn't be a question that we answer, I don't know, or I hope so, or I think so. We need to get to a point in each of our lives where we can answer this question, yes, I know that I am saved, or be able to honestly look at ourselves and say, no, I am not saved. And then to respond accordingly in a way so that we can be. And so what we're going to do this morning, and then we're going to notice an extension of it this evening, is we're going to ask the question, am I saved? But let me make something abundantly clear. You will not hear me give an answer that's based on my opinion or my assumptions. Any answer that we provide to any question that is ancillary to this question, it will come from God's Word. And if it doesn't, I encourage you to reject it. So am I saved? Let's start at the simplest place. What does this question mean? What does it mean to be saved and what are we talking about when we ask this question, am I saved? The simplest way for me to do it, I think, is, is to go through the Bible and look at verses that talk about being saved and find out what we're saved from and what the comparison, what the opposite of saved is in these passages. We'll start with Matthew 1 and verse 21 in which it said concerning Jesus that they would call His name Jesus, Savior, for He shall save His people from their sins. So notice a passage that we've likely heard how many times quoted in our lives, but it's really important to understand the claim there. Number one, we are saved. We are delivered or protected. He will save His people from their sins. So we are lost in sin. It's sin that we're being saved from and we are delivered or protected from the consequences of our sin. So when we ask, am I saved? What we're asking is, am I delivered from the consequences of my sin? Yes or no, am I? We move on in the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 18 and verse 11. The Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. And so now we have the discrepancy between saved, delivered or protected, and lost, a word that means destroyed. So to be saved means to be spared from destruction. So if I ask, am I saved, what I'm asking is, am I protected or delivered from the destruction that is the consequence of my sin? Every one of us has sinned. Romans 3.23, all have sinned 
and come short of the glory of God. If you're here this morning, if you're within the sound of my voice, and you have reached an age at which you understand sin, and you recognize that you have sinned, and you understand the consequences of that sin, then you find yourself in need of deliverance or protection from your sin and from destruction, which is the consequence of your sin. That's what we've learned from Matthew 1.21 and Matthew 18.11. Now, Mark 16.16. 16. Verse 15, Go you therefore, or go you into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's verse 15. Here's what they are to teach specifically. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be condemned. We'll talk about the things connected to this, but notice our two sides. We are, I am either saved or I am condemned. Condemned there means sentenced. I am either sentenced to face the consequences of my sin, which that's destruction, or I am protected and delivered from that. So to deliver or protect, or to die in your sins, to face the consequences of your sins, which is destruction. Romans 5 and verse 9. Much more now, Paul says, being justified, we shall be saved from wrath by Him. Saved from wrath. We have two ideas though here. They're saved, again, it means to protect or to deliver. But then we have justified. To justify means to judge as innocent. So I am either judged as innocent or I am uh, one who is subject to the wrath, the violent passion of God. I need us to understand this is as simple as it can get. I am either delivered or protected, judged as innocent, or I am subject to the wrath of God. Those are my only two options. There's no in-between. There's no option C. I am either saved or I am lost. I am either freed from my sin or I am destined to face the consequences of my sin. Those are the only two options. And am I saved is asking me which one of those options applies to me. That's the question. That's why it's so valuable. That's why it's so important to ask this question. James 1 and verse 21. We are to receive with meekness the engrafted Word which is able to save our souls. In the opening announcements and in our bulletins and in our thoughts and prayers privately, we have mentioned so many who are sick. So many who are struggling with diseases and ailments. So many who are recovering from various things. We have folks who have lost ones dear to them that they love. We have all of these things going on. And we, we talk about being, being cured, being treated, recovering. We talk about being saved physically. But that's not what we're talking about here this morning. I'm not talking about people being saved from the consequences of cancer or from the consequences of an ailment or a disease or whatever the case might be. We are talking about being saved concerning your soul. We're talking about salvation on a spiritual level. Our souls. There is not a physician on the planet who can do anything for your soul or for mine. We are studying right now the only power that can save my soul, the engrafted Word which is able to save our souls. We're talking about my soul. It doesn't show up on an x-ray or a CAT scan or an MRI. The doctor can't point to it on a chart and say, here it is in your body. That is what we're talking about this morning. And only in the context of God can you find salvation for your soul. Verse 26 gives us the contrast. Vanity, emptiness, worthlessness. I, my soul is either saved or it's subject to being defined as useless for eternity. So we have saved and we have lost. And those contrasts as they come throughout the Bible, we have two more. In 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians rather, chapter 2 and verse 15, we're told that 
Christ is a sweet-smelling savor, a sweet savor to them that are saved and to them that perish. He goes on to say, life unto life to those who are saved and death unto death to those who perish. I'm either saved or I'm in the process of facing eternal perishing. I'm either saved or I perish. And then one illustration, Luke chapter 23. There are two thieves crucified with Jesus. And one begins railing at Jesus, and the other stops him in his tracks. After that one said, save yourself and us. That brings us to our topic, right? Salvation. At least one of the thieves crucified with Jesus earnestly desired his own salvation. And he went on to describe both him and the other one uh, crucified with him as being worthy of the condemnation that they were both about to experience. So they recognized that they were on the path to being condemned. And they needed to be saved. And one of those thieves said this to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Now, how did that happen? How was the thief on the cross saved? If you, have, uh, if you write in your Bibles, write out beside this text, Matthew 9 and verse 6, in which it said, Know you not that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. While Jesus was walking upon this earth, He could forgive sins with just a word. When Jesus ascended into heaven, He left His Word, the Gospel, as the means of salvation. And we're going to see that as we continue to move through this study this morning. So what have we done? All I've meant to do in this opening point is to underscore the difference between being saved and being lost. And how important this question is. If I am saved, I am delivered or protected from the consequences of my sin, from the wrath of God's judgment. I am protected from that. But if I am not saved, that means I right now am vulnerable to the destruction that comes with my sin. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. And that's where I stand if I'm not saved. That's why this question is so important. Am I saved? It's not a question to brush off. It's not a, a question to answer quickly without thought. It's a question upon which you and I must ponder because it is the single most important question in every one of our lives. Am I saved? How can I know? How can I know the answer to that question? In my time in talking with folks, I have found that many people draw their answer from many different sources. Unfortunately, most of those sources don't hold up to scrutiny. Some have told me I feel in my heart that I'm saved. Maybe you've had people say that. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, I I'm not sure about specifics, but I just feel as if I am saved. I want to caution you to use your feelings as the gauge by which to answer such an important question. Jeremiah said concerning the heart in chapter 17 and verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. Who can know it? You see, ultimately, my heart tells me what I want to hear. If I want my heart to tell me that I'm saved, it will. You ever talk to a young person who just knew that the, the young person they were dating was the love of their life? Well, how do you know? I, I just feel it. I just feel it. And then next week, those feelings have changed. Their heart told them what they wanted them to feel, what they wanted to believe, what they wanted to know. Unfortunately, our heart can deceive us. An example of that is found in John 16 and verse 2 in which Jesus prepares His disciples for a time when those who kill them 
will believe that they do God a service. Jesus says there will be some who believe in their heart. They feel that by taking the life of disciples, of followers of Christ, that they will be doing God's service. Those people feel in their heart that what they're doing is right. And they attribute that feeling to service to God. But they're wrong. Saul himself, who later became Paul in Acts 23 and verse 1, could say, I've lived in all good conscience before God and to this day. He was standing there with the coats of the people throwing stones at Stephen. In Acts chapter 7 and in the first of Acts chapter 8, he was standing there holding their coats as they threw stones at a preacher of the gospel and killed him. And at that moment, Saul believed in his heart that he was doing right. His conscience was clear. And yet he was as wrong as he would ever be in his life. I caution you, if you say, I feel, I know in my heart that I'm saved, but there's no evidence from the Word of God, I I caution you to build your understanding of salvation on what your heart's telling you. But some might say, well, you know, somebody told me that I was okay. Dear friend, what I'm not here to do this morning is to tell you for you whether or not you're saved. Ultimately, it is you who must make that decision. And you make that decision not based on what I say, but based on what the Word of God says. Have you noticed that every point we've drawn out, we've had to go to the Bible to find a verification for that point. We don't need to take the word of anybody when it relates to this all-important question, am I saved? In Galatians chapter 1, Paul says that he was amazed that the Galatians were so soon removed from him that called him unto the grace of Christ unto another, another gospel, which was not another, but there were some that would trouble them. And then Paul said, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And he said, for good measure, I'm going to say it again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have received, let him be accursed. Anybody who says anything different from the gospel is wrong. So if somebody told me that I was saved, but I didn't see that in the gospel, then those words are useless. Don't let somebody tell you something that's not verified by the Word of God. But I feel it. But someone told me so. Well, you know, there's this one verse. We live in in an interesting world today, and, and we like to try to boil down whole truths to bumper stickers and yard signs and t-shirts, and slogans. But dear friend, I would be very cautious to base my salvation on a bumper sticker, or a yard sign, or a slogan, or one verse yanked from its context. Dear friends, if I know I'm saved, it shouldn't be based on one passage, one verse, and no context. Some might say, well, you know, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on Him should not perish, but of everlasting life. Preacher, I believe, therefore I'm saved. John 3.16 told me so. Have you ever looked at that verse in its context? Did you go back to John chapter 3 when it said a person must be born of water and of the Spirit in order to see the kingdom of God? But better yet, have we examined the larger context Have we looked at verse 36? If you have an English Standard Version, it's one of the most respected modern translations of the New Testament. And in John 3 and verse 36, it translates a word slightly differently than King James does. He, whoever believes in the Son, has eternal life. Whosoever does not... Notice this. This is a word that can mean believe, but belief with something attached to it. Whosoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. According to the parallel structure of verse 36, belief must include what? Obedience. 
You see, if you rip verse 16 out of its context, you never learn that. But how many people will hold up John 3.16 signs, but nobody ever bothers mentioning verse 36? Or the first part of that chapter, being born of water and the Spirit. Don't take one verse and build your life on a misunderstanding of one passage. Acts 16, 30 and 31, you know, Paul and Silas were in prison. An earthquake miraculously came and opened all the doors to the prison. And Paul and Silas noticed that the jailer was about to take his own life. He had his sword drawn. He was ready. And Paul said, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. And then the jailer asked the question that you and I are struggling with this morning. What must I do to be saved? You know what Paul said? Believe with all your heart. And you and your household, you'll be saved. And people will say, well, you know, belief, see there, it's all I need to do. But they don't look at the rest of the context. You see, because as you continue in Acts chapter 16, verses 30 and 34 reveal that they spoke unto Him Word, the Word of the Lord. And when they did that, He and His household were baptized immediately, straightway. And it was only after He was baptized that He was described by the Holy Spirit as believing in God with all His house. What is belief? Understanding that what's being told you is true and acting on it in obedience. That's what we see with the jailer in Acts 16. You see, if you and I are going to answer the question, am I saved, we're not going to be able to just casually peruse the Bible and pick a verse out here or pick a passage out there and say, well, see, this is what it means to be saved. Who would ever do that? Imagine that I was a doctor and you came to me and you had a horrible disease and you wanted me to, uh, to diagnose and treat that disease. And I said, well, well let me just... Pick one part out of a medical book and let me just take a stab at it. You would ask for a second opinion, wouldn't you? You want a doctor who will be thorough. I know of people in this room right now who are only here because their physicians were thorough. They searched the books. They searched the studies. They researched and they found an answer. Not just by casually perusing your chart and saying, well, he's fine. But by digging deep and discovering the truth. Dear friend, our soul is too important to just casually look through the Bible and pick a verse here and there. You see, if it were up to me and my soul were at stake, I would want to dig deep and I would want to know for sure the truth, what I was about to do. In John chapter 1, Philip met Jesus... And he found his friend Nathanael and he said, I have found him, the Messiah, the one the Old Testament talks about. And Nathanael responded skeptically, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And what Philip did is he said, well, let me give you one one statement that just sums all this up and clarifies it all for you. Is that what Philip did? Absolutely not. Philip said, look, this is too important. (laughs) Why don't you just come and look for yourself? Dear friend, your soul is too important. Let me invite you to come to the Word of God and see for yourself. That's the only way to know. Am I saved? Come and see. Let's look together and see what God's Word says. You see, ultimately, how do I know if I'm saved? How do I know the answer to the question? Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. The Bible is going to give me the answer. Not my opinion, not my feelings, not what somebody tells me, not some passage ripped out of its context. The Bible is going to tell me the answer. Romans 1 and verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it... The gospel is the power of God and the salvation. To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. You want to be saved? Consult the gospel. Well, what is the gospel? And have I obeyed it? You see, this is where the rubber meets the road this morning, ladies and gentlemen. 
What is the gospel? Some will tell you, well, it's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, read the first four or five verses. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the foundation of the gospel. It's the foundation of everything that we believe and do, absolutely. But that's not where it ends. You see, let's let the Bible define what the gospel is. 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 8, He began by saying, And you who are troubled, rest with us. That's those who are saved when the Lord shall return, okay? And then he makes this statement in verse 8. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and listen to this, and that obey not, what? The gospel. If I don't obey the gospel, then there's flaming fire vengeance being taken upon me. That's the wrath we talked about in the opening. Obeying the gospel. What else am I taught to obey? Let's define the gospel. Romans 6, 17, But God be thanked, you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart. What? That pattern of teaching, that form of doctrine. The gospel is a pattern of teaching. The gospel is a pattern of teaching, a form of doctrine. 1 Peter 1 and verse 22, Seeing you have purified your souls, how? In obeying the truth. Obeying the truth. I obey the gospel, I obey that form of doctrine. I obey the truth. All those three things are identical. I obey the Word of God. In Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14, and this is the gospel which shall be preached in all the world. So the gospel is that which God, Jesus would tell His disciples to preach in all the world. Matthew 28, 18, what is that? Go you therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I command you. That's the gospel. Are you sure about that, preacher? Mark 16, 15. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That's the gospel. He that believeth not shall be condemned. That's the gospel. It's what those disciples preached when they went into the world. It's what they recorded in the pages of the New Testament. That is the gospel. And it's the power of God unto salvation. It and it alone is what will save you and what will save me. Acts chapter 2, Peter went out and did exactly what Jesus said. He preached the gospel. Those folks said, men and brethren, what shall we do? Verse 36, and Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. In verse 41, then they which gladly received His word were baptized. They were added about 3,000 souls. To what were they added? Verse 47, the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. That's the gospel. They didn't come from my opinion. It came straight out of the pages of the New Testament. From the mouth of inspired preachers and the Lord Himself. Am I saved? Only you can answer that question. When you compare what you have done, the condition that you're in, with what the pages of the New Testament have to say. It doesn't matter my opinion or yours. It doesn't matter what you've heard. It doesn't matter what I've felt. It matters what God instructs through the Gospel. It is the standard by which all of us will be judged. Why did I preach this this morning? Inevitably, there are some here who ask themselves the question, am I saved? And they're confused by the answers that so many times they receive. It's my hope that there has been some clarity presented this morning. But maybe you have loved ones, friends, who you know would answer that question in the negative. And maybe they need to know what to do to be saved. Direct them to this lesson. It will be in, in the cloud forever. Take them to the Word of God. Let them see for themselves 
what the Gospel tells them. But if you are here this morning, and you need to obey the Gospel, let us help you. Don't wait. Consider the terror, the horror of dying in your sins, facing the wrath of God, perishing because you are not saved. Avoid that today. This evening, Lord willing, we will talk about the rest of us. What if we are or have initially done that? Am I still saved? We'll talk more about that tonight, but understand that sin will separate us from God. And maybe this morning you're a Christian and that has happened in your life. You once again find yourself lost. Dear friend, the dire, dire situation is just as it was before. You need to be restored through repentance and confession. Let us pray with you and for you. Tonight or this morning, obey the gospel and be restored as together we stand and sing.